All right. So thank you very much for coming. And I'm glad to see that in the list of participants, there are a number of names that I don't know, which I hope means that you're from the other program. This talk is very much aimed at you. Um, people that are in the modularity program, I don't think you're going to learn anything new at all. Um, but I know sometimes, you know, we spend a lot of time listening to things we don't understand. So sometimes it's nice to listen to things that we do understand. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information on the program, and then I'm going to spend most of my time answering the questions, what is modularity and what is it good for, and saying a little bit about how that connects with our program. So the talk is aimed at physicists, at the correlated systems participants, and at the locals, and it's going to be informal. Um, I didn't think I could actually write uh, in real time on a blackboard uh, and have it, you know, work. So you just have to put up with my bad handwriting on this blackboard background. But feel free to interrupt and to ask questions. Uh, so the organizers are Sergey Gukov, Sarah Harrison, myself, and Ken Ono. And I think in contrast to probably many programs at the KITP, there's a lot of interplay between math and physics. And that's reflected in the organizers. Ken Ono is a mathematician. Sergey, Sarah, and I are physicists or mathematical physicists or mathematical physicists or physical mathematicians, whatever. Um, and it's also reflected in the talks and the participants. So among the talks, there are six by mathematicians and 10 by physicists. But of course, the mathematicians are mathematicians that enjoy interacting with physicists, and the physicists have a tolerance for mathematics. Uh, we've been having two seminars a week, a fairly lively Slack channel where there's been an exchange of ideas, um, usually you know, at, the, at its liveliest after a talk that stimulates people to think about new connections. And we're exploring other ways to interact. We tried Gather Town. Um, I think people have different views on that. Um, I think we might have kind of a gong show. So we're trying to do things that um, stimulate some of the interaction, but obviously not all that we would normally have in a, in a workshop like this. Speaking for myself, I've had several lengthy discussions on new projects, one with uh, someone I've never collaborated with before. Um, I know from some of the other discussions that there are new collaborations that have been started here. So. I'm hoping that that's true for many of the participants, although we haven't done a poll. So my feeling is that the program is working. Um, I'm not in Santa Barbara, which would have been nice, but I feel like there's pretty good evidence that people are exchanging ideas, forming new collaborations, new projects, and that there's been a lot of stimulation as a result of the talk to interaction. So I'm going to start by, by trying to explain what modularity is. And I'm really going to be very basic, so my apologies if it's boring. Um, I'm basically assuming I'm talking to physicists who don't never learned what a modular form was. And um, I never learned what a modular form was in graduate school. Um, it took me until I was working on string theory and learned about conformal field theory. So I'm going to assume you don't know that. And mathematically, in a way, it's a generalization of periodicity. Uh, I think if we'd applied for a program on periodicity in quantum systems, we would have been turned down. It's a little too general, a little too simple. And uh, you know, there are two, two ways that uh, periodicity often occurs in physics. The most important way is you take a system that's in equilibrium and you displace a little bit. And because it's in equilibrium, the first derivative of the energy with respect to the parameters vanishes and all the deviations of the energy are quadratic, and that leads to harmonic motion. So we have clocks like pendula that have a periodicity. But another way that periodicity arises is even if you don't have a periodic system, but you put it at a finite temperature beta, which is one over KT, then the thermodynamics is determined by the partition function, which is the trace of e to the minus beta h. And e to the minus beta h looks like e to the i h t, the time evolution operator, except you've made the time Euclidean and called it beta. So this can be represented as a path integral, uh, as usual, where you wait by e to the minus Euclidean action, but where you work in Euclidean time and the trace in the partition function 
means that you should take the dynamical variables you have to be periodic in Euclidean time. So even if you didn't want to deal with periodic functions, you're kind of forced to do it in doing path integral computations at finite temperature. So how do we construct periodic functions? Well, you might say that you learned that in high school, and undoubtedly you did, but I'm going to take a different point of view, um, maybe one that was developed on that, one of those other many planets that have been discovered that might um, host intelligent life of some sort, some form. So how do we construct periodic functions? Well, we'll take We'll think of the time as a real variable and the real, real numbers are an abelian group. You just add two real numbers and get another one. Periodic functions are invariant under a subgroup of the real numbers, the group of integers. That is taking the time and translating it by n times a period um, is an identification that periodic functions will respect. So we want functions on the quotient of the real numbers by the integers, which is the same as a circle. Now, here's a way that you may not have seen of finding a periodic function. Take some very simple function on the real numbers and sum it over the action of the integers. When you do that, you'll either get zero infinity, or if you don't get zero infinity, you'll have to get a periodic function since you've summed over the action of the group that you're trying to make it invariant under. So trigonometric functions might have been found this way in some other universe or planet. We'll choose the period one for simplicity. We'll take a very simple function like a power. So t to the minus m and average it over z. So this epsilon m of t is a sum over the integers t plus n to the minus m. What is that equal to? Well, I'll leave it as an exercise for n greater than two. And at n equals one, it's a little bit subtle, but you can define this by doing a finite sum and then taking a limit. And with a little bit of work, you'll find that it's pi times the cotangent to pi times t. And if you want to recover sine and cosine or e to the 2 pi i t, uh, that's just a rational function of e1 of t, e1 of t plus i pi over e1 of t minus i pi. That's a kind of new way uh, you could discover trigonometric functions, that is periodic functions. And I've mentioned this because this idea of averaging over a group action is a very common way of constructing modular forms and functions, once I tell you what that means. And in that context, um, this kind of summing over a group action um, is attributed to Poincaré. All right, so now let's go from periodic to modular. So what we imagine is that we have a scale invariant quantum theory defined on a spatial circle. So you could think of a critical icing model. You could think that the circle is the circle of a closed string, and we're going to be looking at that closed string evolving in time. Um, many, you know, uh, there are many interesting two-dimensional systems for which this, this is the case. So in such a theory, we have a Hamiltonian that translates this in time, and we also have an operator that I'll call J that rotates this along the circle or translates this in theta with theta A. Uh, angular coordinate in the circle. Now, if you try to compute the partition function as a path integral, you're really doing a path integral on a product of two circles, one for the Euclidean time and one for this spatial circle. And the product of two circles is a two torus. You can think of it as a square in the plane with opposite sides identified. Now, there's a natural generalization rather than just having a fixed point in the circle and evolving in time, we could evolve in time and at the same time evolve along the circle. And if you think that through for a minute or two, you'll see that it's equivalent to working on a two torus, but one where you take an arbitrary vector omega one in, the, in R2 and another vector omega two, We'll take it not to be degenerate, so they don't, they don't, they're not coincident, they don't have length to zero. And taking R2 mod the lattice generated by omega one and omega two. That's a two torus, 
but one that I would do a path integral over when I combine time translation with spatial location. This would be a good time to pause for questions. And I, yeah. Jeff, maybe I can ask one. This is Andrzej Nowodomski. So I'm a condensed matter theorist. And could you give us an example of where you would naturally would like to define your function on a circle? I mean, we're used in a different cases like spin systems, but coming from high energy physics, where would you like to define your free energy or your function to be defined on R modular integers? Well, we're often interested. I mean, there are many applications of two dimensional conformal field theories. So minimal models, I see model, Hashkin-Teller model, the whole host of 2D conformal field theories that play a role in string theory and that people are interested in generalizing to higher dimensions. So in those theories, you can work on the cylinder if you want, in which you have a spatial circle and then you have time evolution going sort of up along the cylinder. You can then map that cylinder to the complex plane and often people do that. And that's a conformal mapping to the complex plane. And then you're just looking at a quantum field theory in the Euclidean complex plane. But that's conformally equivalent to working on a cylinder. And the only thing that happens, one thing that happens in that mapping is that there is a kind of Casimir energy associated with working on the cylinder that you don't see on the complex plane in the same way. But that's an example. In string theory, two dimensional conformal field theories arise in the simplest case in closed string theories because the closed string at a fixed time slice, it's world sheet is a circle times time. And so you're then the quantization of string theory in the way that violin variance plays in shows you that once you gauge fixed, you have to have conformal invariance on the world sheet. And so then again, you're studying two dimensional conformal field theories on a world sheet that has a spatial circle. So this kind of situation occurs both in, you know, 2D conformal field theories as they arise in condensed matter applications as models of critical behavior, but also in string theory. That's great. Any other questions for Jeff? All right. So I was trying to explain where modular transformations come from. And the point I was at is that we're considering systems at finite temperature and on a spatial circle. But we're now considering a path integral over a more general two torus that depends upon omega one and omega two. But I can pull out an overall factor of omega two and call the ratio omega one over omega two tau. And in a scale invariant theory, the overall scale of the torus will be irrelevant. So we can just drop this factor. And we can therefore say that the two torus that we're working on only depends on a single complex parameter tau. And you can also make a choice, I think, of the orientation of the two torus so that the imaginary part of tau is positive. So tau labels a point in the upper half complex plane. That is the complex plane where the imaginary part is positive. So we then have the following simple fact that has a deep consequence. Let's suppose that for some reason you don't like this choice of basis of the lattice and you want to make a new choice to basis vectors omega one prime and omega two prime. These also have to be lattice vectors, so they have to be integer combinations of omega one and omega two. So they have to be of the form A omega one plus B omega two for A and B are integers. And similarly, omega two prime has to be C omega one plus D omega two with C and D integers. Now, if AD minus BC is equal to one, then you can check that the area of a fundamental cell of a lattice with basis omega one prime and omega two prime is the same as the area of a fundamental cell with basis omega one and omega two. So in other words, 
omega one prime and omega two prime describe exactly the same lattice. They're just using a different basis. And so the quotient of R2 by this new lattice is the same two torus. So if you now translate that action to an action on tau, it simply tau goes to A tau plus B over C tau plus D. And we can combine A, B, and C, D into a two by two matrix. And this two by two matrix of integers with determinant one defines what's called the modular group SL2Z. Two by two in, uh, matrices over the integers with determinant one. And the argument I've given you is that the partition function of such a theory should be invariant under these modular transformations of tau because all they're doing is changing the basis for the lattice that I used to identify what the two torus is. A slightly fancier way of saying it is if you translate this into sort of coordinates on the two torus and diffeomorphisms, these are changes of coordinates that is diffeomorphisms that are not connected to the identity. They look like taking the two torus and slicing it open and then doing a two pi twist and reconnecting it or exchanging the two circles. So it's a very, it's a simple argument, but it has uh, deep consequences. All right, so this, that's what the modular group is. It's the group SL2Z and it should be a symmetry of this particular class of quantum systems, quantum systems that have a periodic circle and where we're looking at finite temperature, computing the Euclidean partition function. So I now wanna say a little bit about the modular group and modular functions, and then we'll get back to some physics. So all elements of SL2Z are products of the element T, which takes tau to tau plus one, uh, you can take any, the nth power of t, that takes tau to tau plus n, so there's clearly a copy of the integers inside SL2z. And in that way, modular invariance is kind of a generalization of periodicity. Um, and the other element that, that is a generator of SL2z is s, which takes tau goes to minus one over tau. And if you remember that tau is the ratio of omega one to omega two, tau goes to minus one over tau is basically exchanging the spatial circle with the Euclidean time circle. ST is not equal to TS, so the modular group is non-abelian. So modularity is much more powerful than just periodicity, and it's more powerful for a number of reasons. It's somehow much more powerful than you would expect, but I think in part, in part it's powerful because it's non-abelian or than abelian, there's a very rich uh, subgroup structure. And also complex analysis plays a central role because tau is a complex number and you can demand various kinds of holomorphy or meromorphy in tau when you look at functions that are well behaved under the modular group. And the math point of view on modularity is also quite interesting. So periodic functions, we can think of as functions that live on the quotient of the real numbers by the integers. Uh, modular functions, I said, uh, were invariant under SL2Z and tau lives in the upper half plane. But the upper half plane can be realized geometrically or group theoretically by taking the group SL2R two by two real matrices of determinant one. That contains SO2 or U1 as a compact subgroup. You can take the quotient by that on the right and then the quotient on the left by SL2Z. So that kind of generalizes the structure that we had in a periodic group. R has no compact subgroup, so there's nothing to mod out by. And mathematicians of course love to generalize this. So they, often generalizes this to consider general Lie groups G mod out by some compact subgroup, maximal compact subgroup K on the right, and then divide by some arithmetic subgroup of G on the left. And many of the deepest developments in modern math are outgrowths of modularity in this kind of generalized sense. But um, we're interested for the moment in constructing modular functions 
And in doing so, we have to decide what we want to demand. It turns out that the simplest theory arises when we try to make functions that are holomorphic in tau. Things are a little more complicated, but still very tractable if they're meromorphic in tau. And then there are most general cases, you don't make any kind of demand of holomorphy. And those play an important role too, but I'm going to focus on the first two cases just for simplicity. So to get something that's holomorphic, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment, you can't find a function that is completely invariant. Rather, it has to be invariant up to some factors, some weight, which um, the formula on the left-hand side is that a function of weight k, a weight k modular form, transforms under modular transformations of tau up to a factor of c tau plus d to the k times f of tau. And that prefactor basically comes um, well, one way of understanding it, I guess, is thinking in terms of SL2R mod U1, uh, the upper half plane, and the fact that there is a metric of constant negative curvature on that, and that metric looks like um, D2 tau over M tau squared, and the C tau plus D is the way that M tau transforms. In any event, you can construct these by averaging over the modular group, but you now have to average with this weight K action. So if you define a weight k action on a function to be a modular transformation of tau multiplied by c tau plus d to the minus k, then these weight k modular forms are just invariant under that action. And you can make such functions by averaging very simple functions under this action. So the simplest function in the world is the constant one. The weight k action of one is just c tau plus d to the minus k. And if you add, sum that over SL2z, well, you get infinity because all those integer transformations that just take tau to tau plus one do nothing to, to one. So you should divide by that group, which is gamma infinity. So now if you sum over SL2z mod this copy of the integers that lives inside, this gives you a modular form for k and even integer greater than two. And uh, essentially all holomorphic modular forms are constructed in this way. That's the generalization of how I told you to make your periodic functions. If you want something that's meromorphic, well, you can use these uh, EKs, these Eisenstein series to make something that's meromorphic. There are two ways of waking, making weight 12 objects, E4 cubed and E6 squared. And if you take the ratio of E4 cubed to E4 cubed minus E6 squared up to some coefficient, which is chosen for simplicity, uh, you get something called J of tau. And J is invariant under modular transformations. There's no funny weight K factor, but it's meromorphic on uh, the upper half plane if you include the point at infinity. So, when you expand it in powers of Q, which is e to the two pi i tau, you can do that because it is, it's invariant and your tau goes to tau plus one. So this is a kind of Fourier expansion. Then this Q to the minus one means that as the imaginary part of tau goes to infinity and Q goes to zero, there's the pole. And in the theory of modular functions, J plays a very central role. The upper half plane mod SL2Z takes the form of this shaded region here, that's the fundamental domain. All taus can be mapped into this region by SL2Z. And every point in here is mapped to precisely one point in the Riemann sphere, the complex plane with a point at infinity added by this J function. All right, so that's a little bit about what modularity is. It's this modular group that has various kinds of modular functions that transform nicely into the modular group. What's it good for? Well, the first thing that modular functions do in physics and in math is they count things. They count things that we're often interested in. Um, in math, they count things like the partitions of integers, the number of points in a lattice of given length. That can also be interesting in physics. 
Uh, the number of states of certain black holes, which is relevant for computing the entropy of black holes. Um, the number of states in two-dimensional conformal field theories. The number of solutions to certain Diophantine equations. The dimensions of representations of sporadic finite simple groups and on and on and on. They count an amazing number of things. And there's a, a quote, which might be apocryphal, but it's a nice quote anyway. Um, by Eichler, which is, there are five elementary arithmetical operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modular forms. Um, and if that gives you the impression that modular forms are something that you should learn in grade school, um, there might be some truth to that. So I want to give you some examples of modular forms and how they count things. So here's an example that you might encounter in physics. <clears throat> let lambda be a lattice and define its theta function to be a sum over all elements of the lattice, q to the length squared of the lattice point divided by two. And again, q is e to the two pi i tau. So if lambda is even, meaning all the points have uh, length squared, which is an even integer, and self-dual, meaning that the lattice is the same as the reciprocal lattice, then you can easily show that this theta function uh, is invariant under tau goes to tau plus one, because you always have q to integer powers here. And under tau goes to minus one over tau, it transforms like a modular form of the rank of lambda over two. So if you want to get something that's a modular form on the nose, you have to find a lattice that is even and self-dual. And the smallest such lattice is a rank eight lattice, a lattice in eight dimensional space called the E8 root lattice. And this theta function has an expansion whose coefficients count the number of points in that lattice of length squared two, length squared four, et cetera. Now you could apply the same technology to lattices that you might be more familiar with in condensed matter systems like the triangular lattice. And there you won't get exactly a modular form, <clears throat> rather you'll get um, well, you'll get a sum over um, the reciprocal lattice and a factor that depends upon uh, the index of the lattice and the reciprocal lattice. But you will get things that are modular under subgroups of the modular group. So this um, has a, a nice structure for even self-dual lattices, but is something that has nice modular properties, uh, just not quite as nice for more general lattices. Can I just ask a question? Just to yes. Follow. Um, so when you talk about the state of function, is it supposed to represent anything special like the state of functions we might use in physics for in topological field theories? Or what is the state of function, just some function? It's a very well, naive question here. I think almost every theta function you've ever encountered can be thought of as associated to a lattice. It might be a very simple lattice, like just the integers. Uh, and it might be a lattice where you're um, shifting lattice vectors by an element of the dual lattice. But um, I guess you'd have to tell me what theta what functions you've encountered before. Sort of the most basic fun theta function in the world is just the sum on nq to the n squared or n squared over two, depending on your conventions. That's just associated to the lattice of integers where the length squared of a point associated to the integer n is n squared. So the, that the most basic theta function in the world is just associated to the lattice of integers in the real line. And these are just higher dimensional generalizations of that. There are also theta functions where you do things like sum q to the n plus a half squared over two. Um, mm -hmm. And then, well, I'd have to get my factors right, but basically they're associated with sums over lattices or sums over lattices um, shifted by uh, elements of the reciprocal lattice or the dual lattice. Does that help? Um. A little bit. I guess I was looking for a physical interpretation of this this function, but maybe this is still too abstract at this point. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. 
Um, well, I mean, so um, this is kind of a string theory CFT answer, but um, one of the simplest kinds of conformal field theories or vertex operator algebras um, consists of some set of n bosons, which um, uh, essentially have a periodicity of some lattice. And then the partition function of that theory is this theta function of the lattice divided by the dedicate eta function to the rank of the lattice. So these are a building block in the partition function of um, free bows on conformal field theories. All right, thanks. Jeff, can I ask uh, another, sorry, this is an elementary question. So Q, which appeared already in a couple of slides, and you, you write uh, an expansion of theta function in either Laurent or Taylor series in Q, mm -hmm. right? Um, this Q is defined as, looks like in a complex plane, as 2 pi i to the power of tau. Now, could you remind us what tau was? Because in your initial elementary examples, that was like imaginary time, and then it had, was a periodic function. But then you said, oh, but let's work on a two torus. So now tau is that, does it have two indices? So what is tau here? Tau is a, is a complex number whose imaginary part is positive and it labels a two torus. It, it labels inequivalent two tori up to rescaling. So I think mathematically you'd say it labels conformal equivalence classes of two dimensional tori. Right, I see. Okay, now, now that makes sense. So that's why the, let's say, the physical quantity should, the like partition function, should not depend on how you reparameterize the torus, and that's where modularity comes from. Absolutely. And then the connection with the power series in Q, uh, is there any physical meaning that one could probe? Like, is there any special about the number 240? other than geometrically counting the number of points in the lattice, is it like a number of reparameterization of a tori? No, the, 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 the periodicity in tau, go, tau goes to the tau plus one. Um, the real part of tau is, is basically like the radius of that circle. So the periodicity in theta, the coordinate on that circle, is the invariance under tau goes to tau plus one. But the coefficients in this expansion of the theta function, um, they're sort of whatever they have to be as dictated by the fact that this is a modular form of weight four. They, I mean, in this particular case, they have a group theoretical interpretation. So in the Lie group E8, <clears throat> there are, the adjoint representation has dimension 248. There are eight elements in the Cartad subalgebra and 240 is the number of uh, simple roots. But it's also just the number of points of a given length in this lattice. <coughs> the kind of amazing thing, and the, and the reason that the generalization to modular functions is so deep, I guess, is that these coefficients in this Q expansion often count things, have very interesting properties, and they're dictated in a very non-obvious way by the demands of modularity. It's kind of astounding how powerful modularity is in determining these coefficients and all sorts of uh, geometric and arithmetic interpretations of them. <clears throat> Let me give another example. So let P of n be the number of ways to write a positive integer n as a sum of positive integers. So four can be written as four, three plus one, two plus two, two plus one plus one, or one plus one plus one plus one. So P of four is equal to five if I did it right. And you can define a generating function for these P of n's. So here, this Q here is really just a formal variable, but eventually I want to think of it as before. But if you sum P of N Q to the N, that can be expressed as one over the product on N, one minus Q to the N. This might not be completely obvious, but if you 
take the n equals one term and then expand this, you'll see that it's counting the number of ways of writing n as just n ones, there's one way. And then the term with q squared expanded out is counting the way of writing it with twos. And then we take the product, it's counting all the ways of writing it as the sum of integers. And this generating function, this f of q, up to a power q to the minus one over 24 is one over eta of q, where this is called the Dedekind eta function. And it's a modular form of weight minus a half. I put a little star here to keep mathematicians happy because I haven't really defined what this is, but more or less it's a modular form of weight minus a half. And physically this arises if you have the massless boson in one plus one dimensions, very simple conformal field theory. And this is sort of the part of the partition function that just comes from all the oscillator modes of the, of the free boson. Uh, so I think my problem, okay, why? All right. I can't click on, yeah, clicking on Zoom and then going back to clicking on slides is a no-no. I, I have to not do that. All right, the third example. So I told you about this function J of tau. A constant, of course, is a modular function of weight zero. So I, I'm just going to subtract the constant piece. And then you have this expansion of J in terms of Q with rather large integer coefficients. And here, these coefficients have a completely bizarre interpretation. 196884 is 196883 plus 1. 2149376060 is 2126876 plus 196883 plus 1. And it continues on. And these numbers, 119683, et cetera, are dimensions of irreducible representations of something called the monster group. So there's a classification of all finite groups. Finite groups can be, 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 can be decomposed into simple finite groups. And finite simple groups come in infinite families or 26 weirdos that don't fit any kind of pattern. And the largest of those is the monster. It's a group with about 10 to the 54 elements. This crazy, crazy observation that there seems to be a connection between this modular function and the representation theory of this bizarre group uh, went under the name of Montrous Moonshine when it was first discovered. And it's now been partially explained by the existence of a two-dimensional conformal field theory with precisely J minus 744 as its partition function and with the monster group acting as the symmetry group of that conformal field theory. A fourth example, is to take one over eta to the 24, it's usually called one over delta. Uh, that's related to 24 bosons, but it has an interpretation in string theory, in the heterotic string, as counting certain what are called half BPS states, states that preserve half of the supersymmetry in a supersymmetric string, string theory. And there are complicated generalizations of this, which require somewhat more complicated modular objects, which count black hole states in supergravity theories and are behind um, the claims that it's possible to essentially compute the entropy of black holes using string theory. So a second um, thing that modularity is good for is that it determines asymptotics. And I want to give you an example of this both in physics and in mathematics. So Q is e to the two pi i tau, and that goes to zero as tau goes to i infinity, off to the that point at infinity in that fundamental domain. S transformations take tau to minus one over tau. If I call tau prime minus one over tau, then, then Q prime is e to the two pi i tau prime. That goes to one as tau goes to i infinity, as tau prime is minus one over tau. Now, if you think of this in physics terms, where the real part of tau came from the periodicity of the spatial circle, and the imaginary part of tau is the temperature, this relationship using modularity between tau and minus one over tau is a relationship between high and low temperature behavior of the system. 
All right, so let me give you the examples of how you use modularity to determine asymptotics. So one um, was originally due to Hardy and Ramanujan and then refined by Rademacher. The partitions of N, P of N, can be written in terms of that generating function by doing a contour integral and dividing f of q by q to the n plus one, and then picking out the pole using the Cauchy residue formula as usual gives you P of n. But f basically has modular properties because up to this factor of q to the one over 24, it's related to one over eta and eta has modular properties. So by using this expression and the modular properties of eta, you can pretty easily write down a saddle point approximation at large n to this contour integral. And it gives you that P of n grows like e to the pi square root of two n over three. That's kind of a leading exponential in the saddle point. And then when you do the fluctuations around that, you get a subleading term, which involves this one over four square root of three n. And actually, Hardy and Ramanujan wrote down not just this leading asymptotic behavior, but a infinite series, which however was not quite convergent. And then Rademacher figured out how to actually write down a convergent closed form sum for P of N, which you can use to compute P of N to extremely high accuracy for large values of N. Now, a physics application um, of this was um, discussed by John Cardi in a very famous paper. So in in a quantum field theory on a circle, there's a Casimir energy associated with uh, being on a system of you know, finite size, R. And that Casimir energy goes like C over 12 R, where C is a constant that depends on the field content of the theory. And it's natural uh, to define a partition function, which takes that into account and is a trace of Q to the L naught minus C over 24, Q bar to the L naught bar over C over 24. This is that kind of object I was talking about before where you propagate partly in time and partly on the circle. So here L naught is basically H plus J and L naught bar is H minus J uh, from my earlier discussion. And modularity tells you that this partition function should be invariant under modular transformations and particularly it should be invariant under tau goes to minus one over tau. Now, in a way that's very similar to the Hardy Ramanujan um, estimate of P of N, you can compute the number of states with energy N at large N because you can compute the large temperature, the high temperature and low temperature behavior of the theory can be related using modularity. So using that in a saddle point approximation gives you a formula for the entropy of a conformal field theory called the Cardi entropy, which involves the square root of this quantity C, the central charge, C over six times N minus C over 24. And this has played a very important role, not only in conformal field theory, but there's a correspondence between certain conformal field theories and string theory and anti sitter space. And this formula plays a very important role in checking that correspondence and is related to similar formulas that are derived by studying gravity and anti sitter space. And I'm not going to try to explain that. And a third, um, apparently unrelated, but actually it is related, uh, use of modularity is it's kind of a secret behind electric magnetic duality. So you probably learned at some point that Maxwell's equations in vacuum have a duality symmetry where the electric field is exchanged with the magnetic field and the magnetic field goes into minus the electric field. Um, and then it's, I think in Jackson, for example, it's pointed out how useless this is because as soon as there are source terms which you need to produce electromagnetic waves, the symmetry is broken because we have point electric charges, but we don't have point magnetic charges. But as theoretical physicists, we can consider theories that go beyond what we know, generalizations of the standard model where the electromagnetic interactions are embedded into some kind of simple Lie group, some grand unified theory. And in such theories, when the symmetry is broken down to electromagnetism, you find that there are magnetic monopole solutions. And so you have a hope of, in those theories, having some kind of a duality between electricity and magnetism. 
but that duality would also have to exchange fundamentally electrically charged objects with fundamental magnetically charged objects. And in these gauge theories, the masses of electrically charged objects, for example, the X or W bosons, like in the standard model, have a mass that goes like gauge coupling squared times some scale. And the monopoles have a mass that is inversely proportional to the coupling. So if there was going to be a symmetry that exchanged E and B and exchanged these electric and magnetic objects, it would also have to exchange the coupling with the inverse coupling which means it would have to relate a perturbative quantum field theory to a non-perturbative quantum field theory. One at weak coupling would have to be related the same somehow as one at strong coupling. Now, I guess one of the few benefits of growing older in physics is that you get to see how ideas evolve. And during my career, the existence of a duality like this in a non-trivial interacting four-dimensional quantum field theory went from a wild speculation, which I think was first made by Montanen and Olive, and was very widely believed to be not true and completely uncheckable, even if it were somehow true, to a generally accepted fact. And I find this one of the most remarkable things that's, that's happened just in purely theoretical physics. <laughs> or certainly in mathematical physics. And an important step in this was to take the idea of a weak strong coupling duality and to generally generalize it to a modular transformation. So in gauge theories, there are actually two parameters. There's the gauge coupling, which determines the strength of interactions. And then there's a topological term called the theta term, which involves F wedge F or in electromagnetism it would be a term involving E dot B. It's a surface term, so it doesn't affect the equations of motion. It doesn't show up in perturbation theory, but there are non-perturbative effects like instantons that are sensitive to the presence of theta. And theta, as its name implies, is an angular parameter. Uh, the theory doesn't change if you change theta by two pi. So you can combine theta and g into a complex parameter I'll call tau sub g, which is theta over two pi plus four pi i over g squared. And the weak strong coupling duality and the periodicity of theta combine to give SL2z transformations on tau. And if you demand, or if you ask, what would, what would that imply? Well, one of the things that it implies is that there has to be a state in the theory that has magnetic charge two and electric charge one. And Ashok Sen gave this argument and then showed that you could construct this state. And because the state is a special state called the BPS state, it has to exist both at weak and strong coupling. So this was really one of the first very non-trivial pieces of evidence for this kind of weak strong coupling duality. But it's now understood that this new modularity, modularity, the same group, but acting on completely different parameters, parameters that appear in defining 4D gauge theories, uh, is really the old modularity in new clothing. So there is a somewhat mysterious super conformal quantum field theory in six dimensions, which is kind of the maximal dimension if you don't have spin greater than one. And we know a little bit about it, but not as much as we would like. But it's known that if you take this theory and you formulate it on a two torus times four dimensional Minkowski space, then it inherits an SL2Z duality from the modular group acting on the two torus that I discussed earlier. And furthermore, it reduces to a particular gauge theory, N equals four supersymmetric Yang Mills on, on R4 or R31, which has this this duality, this electric magnetic duality. So it turns out that this other kind of modularity that seems to be related to weak strong coupling is actually the same modularity, but with different implications. And more generally, you can consider this theory on a two torus times a general four manifold. And then you can use modularity and properties of quantum field theory to study invariance of four manifolds. And that's quite an active area. And we've had a couple of talks at this meeting about, or we'll have a couple of talks at this meeting about um, aspects of how this works. 
So what are we doing in this program and where is this subject headed? Um, uh, I'm not going to try to explain everything that we're doing, um, but just in a general way, we're exploring connections between new types of modular objects in physics or physical mathematics. Um, I've really only scratched the surface. The theory of modular forms and functions is incredibly rich. It includes not only the things that I've discussed, but other more exotic things. There are things called mock modular forms, which were invented by Ramanujan, and they arise in a number of physics contexts where supersymmetry plays a role in canceling kind of fermions and bosons, and when it works correctly, it makes things holomorphic, but you can have theories that are super symmetric, but where you have a continuum and the, and the density of states of fermions and bosons are different. And that density of states makes things non-holomorphic. And there's kind of a tension between holomorphy and modularity. And that tension is, cop is captured by these mock modular forms. And there's been a lot of progress in understanding them in the mathematics community, and they're now starting to be a lot of very interesting applications of them in physics. There are even more exotic objects called quantum modular forms that were kind of invented by Don Zage, who's going to give a talk about them later. And they're also related to some objects which come up in mathematical physics, for example, not invariance as defined by Chern Simons theory. We're exploring new kinds of math structures, or I think some of the mathematicians are, um, sometimes suggested by or informed by non-rigorous physics results. So this two-dimensional, the six-dimensional superconformal field theory called the two-zero theory is an inspiration for a lot of mathematics. Um, new kinds of conformal field theories or things called VOAs closely related to them are suggested by physical constructions. And we're trying to understand hints of new connections in physics where modularity plays a role. For example, um, superconformal field theories in four dimensions with n equals two supersymmetry have relations to modularity. And we think that there are new things like conformal field theories, either conformal field theories that we haven't really understood or that generalize the structure in some way that explain other kinds of these moonshine connections between groups and um, various kinds of modular forms. So I want to end by asking this question. Um, <clears throat> how far down the modular rabbit hole do you want to go? Do you want to take the blue pill and stay in our comfortable physics world? Or do you want to take the red, red pill and go all the way down the rabbit hole? So in math. So, so the, Jeff, I think we, we, we're going to have to pause and maybe stop. I'm not sure how much more you had. Almost nothing. I think one more slide. Oh, great, great. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm running over a little bit, but this, yeah, I think there's one more slide after this. Got it. So in, uh, in math, this two torus is called an elliptic curve. Um, I've shown a picture of it on, on the right. Uh, it's labeled by one complex parameter tau, and it looks like a donut. But you can define an elliptic curve as the solution to a particular equation that roughly looks like y squared equals x cubed plus ax squared plus b, either over the complex numbers, over the real numbers, in which case it looks like this yellow figure, or over the rational numbers, in which case there are only finite points on this curve uh, that uh, sort of live on this elliptic curve over the rational over the rational numbers. And these elliptic curves over rational numbers have amazing uh, properties. They have a kind of group law, which I've kind of sketched here, that allow you to generate new points. And there are many deep conjectures about the structure of this group law and various kinds of modular forms that involve some of the deepest mathematics going on. For example, there's something called the modularity theorem, which was at the center of the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Uh, the birch swinnerton dyer conjecture is related to the structure of this group law. So it raises the question of whether physicists should try to understand and use this in some way. Should we enlarge our view of physics to include some kind of deeper number theoretic aspects where a lot of the deep mathematics lies? Or is that just where physics and math diverge? And 
this is a very difficult question and one that may be more appropriate for the far distant future. But I hope that meetings like this stimulate thoughts in these directions and maybe something really interesting will come out of it because both the physics and the math that's being discussed here is really incredibly intriguing and the connections are, seem to go very deep. So thank you and apologies for running over and I'm happy to hang out and answer questions for a while if people have questions. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. Let's give everybody a round of applause. I'm applauding you, Jeff. Thank you, thank you. Let's see if there's more questions. Just jump in. Uh, Jeff, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, this is a really beautiful talk, but I'd sort of like to ask a Steve Aller style question uh, with his late obsession. Uh, everything you said is beautiful based on the very beautiful properties of complex numbers, you know, e to the 2 i and so others. I have math mathematicians try to generalize this to quaternions. Now you know why it's the Steve Aller type question. Yeah. Um, maybe there's a mathematician here who can answer. <laughs> um, I know they've certainly, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some version of um, or generalization of modularity where um, quaternions play a role, but I suspect they would not be really fundamental, but just one example of some general structure. I mean, mathematicians are happy to work over the rationals, various extensions of the rationals. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I guess I don't have a good quick answer to that. Maybe some mathematician will chime in. Okay. I can make one brief comment if it's okay. Sure. Please, please, Minion. Yeah. Um, so quaternionic groups are very common. Things like units inside the quaternion rather than SL2Z. Those, those are the so automorphic forms associated to those groups are very important in some way. But the analytic structure of quaternion, I, I don't think it's ever come up in relation to automorphic forms. What I mean is if you're thinking about quaternions occur a lot group theoretically, but not so much in the way complex numbers occur. <laughs> Maybe I can ask a question. Sure, please, Lance. I mean, I think uh, besides the modular group, to get a lot of mathematical control, a very important thing is holomorphicity. Yeah. And there are some contexts where you have mod modular invariance, but you don't have holomorphicity. And uh, so then the question is, how fast do you sort of lose control there? In some cases, maybe you do have holomorphic, um, holomorphic modular, but for another group that's not quite as strong as SL2Z. Maybe you can comment on some of that. Well, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are many um, situations where um, you have subgroups of the modular group that play a role. Um, an example that um, obviously you know well our rational conformal field theory or orbital folds, um, where the individual characters of a rational conformal field theory are not invariant under the full modular group, they're invariant under some subgroup, and then they mix among themselves according to some finite dimensional representation of the mod modular group. So they're vector valued modular forms. And particular sectors of an orbital fold are only going to be invariant under some subgroup of the modular group. Um, so there, I think um, one has almost as much control because it might be calculationally more difficult, but mathematicians know how to construct bases of forms on congruent subgroups of the modular group. It just can get more tedious and involved. And do the um, numbers grow much faster, you know, if I ask you how many of them there are? Yeah, I mean, dimensions of cost. Then I make the index, yeah. Dimensions of cusp form grows, you know, uh, you can have cusp forms, weights that you didn't have for the full modular group. So gamma dot 11 has a weight two cusp form and, you know, gamma dot n for n less than 
11 dozen. Okay. So yeah, you start getting larger uh, spaces of forms. Um, so I guess if you need to, you know, need to know something about absolutely huge levels, then it could be very difficult. But if they're relatively low, then it's just, uh, you know, calculationally more involved, retractable. Um, you know, a lot of the calculations in various kinds of moonshine have involved um, calculations with bioreforms of finite level. Thanks. As for the non-holomorphic, um, I really, yeah, it's not something that I know a lot about. I mean, a recent example was in our, in the program was the talk by Alex Maloney of averaging over conformal field theory, where the siegel Vey formula gives you this non-holomorphic Eisenstein series as a, as an answer. So there's a calculation where the answer is completely non-holomorphic, but you have very good control over what it is and probably can generalize it. So I think it probably depends quite a bit on exactly what question you're trying to answer, how much control you have. Thanks. Well, let's thank Jeff one final time uh, for such a great talk at lunch. Thank you, Jeff.